All right, hi everyone. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Amir Bomani. I'm a computer scientist, and I'm going to talk today about uh, precision medicine from the perspective of a computer scientist. So the talk is going to be around deep data needs and challenges uh, in precision medicine. First talk, a part of my talk will be around needs and challenges. Then I will touch some of the disruptive solutions that we designed and implemented at Stanford the School of Medicine. Uh, so I think many of you are familiar with this uh, research in 2015 that is saying the top 10 highest grossing drugs in the United States are only helping with a small fraction of the people who are taking it. And the, what's the problem? The problem is not the medication, of course, it's uh, uh, physicians that they did not have enough information to predict if the medication would respond positively or not. So uh, when we talk about uh, deep data, of course, you know, when uh, we're talking, we want to move from point A to Z, let's say from France to Germany, there are layers of information that would help us, like say, uh, COVID-19 restriction. We are talking about wildfire uh, traffic. And every one of these layers are actually going to help you to make a better decision, to get there safe and sound. Similarly, when we are talking about precision medicine, our health is a product of a microbiome. Uh, it's a, a genomics, of course, yeah, exposome, which creates our metabolism. But when you start collecting data, right, for every one of these layers, then your cost function rapidly changed toward computation and storage. And this is actually on the right side, you can see that there is a big gap between the CPU performance and the genomics data that we're collecting uh, uh, genomics data exponentially. And on the left side, uh, our wonderful leader, we collected around the two petabyte of data around Mike Snyder, chair of the Department of Genetics. Right now that I'm talking to you, if you want to store one petabyte of data on any major cloud provider, it will cost you $20,000 roughly monthly, $20,000. So clearly we need a better computation on storage systems. When we talk about deep data, uh, there are four needs. We are talking about data acquisition, data storage, data distribution, which is where is it located, different continent, data storage, different layers, and data analysis, which is AI ML. So, we're dealing with three major challenges. The first one is, of course, the scalability. Right now, research labs are under yeah, a lot of pressure to scale their solutions, right? So your algorithm has to work for the large number of participants. The second piece is interoperability, which is intertwined with scalability. And the third piece is security and privacy, which is the foundation of any medical application. I usually refer to scalability as a, a dragon with multiple heads, because it's just not infrastructure scalability. You could have... Uh, uh, team scalability, organizational scalability, and uh, security is more like an angel of death. When it comes, then it's, everything is over. So, but what is the biggest problem? The biggest problem is not even those. The biggest problem is the gap between engineering departments and the School of Medicine. We cannot easily communicate with each other. So let's assume, I'm talking about multidisciplinary teams, right? Uh, let's assume teams are in the School of Medicine are like soccer team, and uh, a forward player more like a data scientists, this is how we are forming teams in the School of Medicine. Everybody want to be a Cristiano Ronaldo. But what is the problem with this? Well, you have to scale, right? So who is going to take care of the rest of the field? We have a scalability teams, right? Security and privacy teams. So the credit system is mainly toward AI ML right now. The other problem that we see is that uh, uh, researchers or disruptors tend to uh, push this responsibility around scalability and security to university IT, and then the disruptors on the left side. And the university IT is typically actually on top of the AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. So what's gonna happen is that we have a lot of friction here. We created a global governance, right? These two are kind of, you know, uh, having problems uh, in a sense that the researcher disruptors are coming with the solutions and they're expecting the university IT to somehow scale it for them. On the other side, university IT are very concerned because they have to t protect the privacy of participants. So what should we do? We need to uh, definitely create a federated teams, equipped researchers, and uh, these guys need to be cross-functional teams, as I mentioned, multidisciplinary teams, that, uh, it, that they can communicate easily and they can deploy their uh, uh, solutions on the major cloud providers. At the same time, university IT should be a cross-functional team of these experts coming from the research teams. 
Uh, if you're interested, you can read this data mesh book recently published by uh, Jamak Degani. The chapter five is around federated teams. Definitely, uh, it's about maintaining dynamic equilibrium between domain autonomy and global governance. So now I'm gonna talk about disruptive solutions that we develop uh, at the Stanford School of Medicine. The first one is uh, around the first a uh, couple of them actually are about um, variable devices, and then I will talk about multi-omics and educational system. So of course, variable devices are helping a lot of us. In 2017, uh, Mike Snyder, the chair of the Department of Genetics, created an algorithm the team, uh, to detect uh, Lyme disease and uh, infectious disease. And I met him in 2017. He was like, Amir, can we create a platform that can scale, you know, can we collect, you know, thousands of participants' data. That was the uh, problem at that time. So we started creating this platform, and the first problem was the fact that we wanted to push some PHI data to the public cloud, and that was a big uh, issue for us. So what we de decided at that time was like, can we put PHI data on a university uh, system and then go with the non-PHI or less sensitive data, de-identified and move it to the public cloud? So um, that was the idea because, again, you know, speaking of personalized medicine, my health is different, yours is different, of course, right? So if we can transform uh, my data, right, to something that would be only meaningful with respect to my data, then that would help a lot to reduce the risk, right? So that's the idea, the core idea behind my PhD platform. So again, I'm gonna really very fast touch some of these solutions, but if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer those questions. The first case study was around COVID-19. We wanted to test this platform and uh, we created uh, like around 60 uh, members, uh, uh, 30 engineers and 30 biologists and bioinformaticians were actually working together. We collected over 5,300 MyPhD users, their variable data. They were high risk and the 30 of them were COVID positive. And we were able to create an algorithm that successfully detects COVID-19 up to 10 days and a medium of four days before first reported symptom. This was published in Nature Biomedical Engineering. In the second phase, again, this is in five months. So it was like a three months of work. So again, you know, referring to the federated team. So engineers and biologists together. In the second phase of our study, we wanted to uh, create an alert system that we can alert our participants. So we created this platform published in Nature Medicine. Uh, it's a lightweight algorithm uh, that again, you can see here that on the top we pull data, de-identify it, shift it to a future date. We run the algorithm, do the analysis, and uh, encrypt it, send it to the phone, decrypt it, re-identify it, and present it to the participants. The sensitivity of the algorithm is 80%, and it's really lightweight. Again, it's 80% uh, 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 sensitivity, and it's running on the phone right now. It scales really well. And we're using some concepts like uh, state machines that is coming from computer science in this uh, platform. So this is my PhD right now. We are scaling the platform, and we are covering more studies. If you're interested, please let us know. We'd be happy to host your study. And uh, the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, multi-omics. And uh, this is actually one of the collaborations we had with the VA MVP, Million Veteran Program, that they are planning to sequence one million genomes. So when you get to one million, right, we're talking about scale, right? So uh, bioinformaticians, they're typically dealing with a pipeline. And every stage of the pipeline is like a human. There are different behavior. It could be IO bound, it could be CPU bound, right? It could be memory bound. And you have a range of different machines in the cloud. Let's say on Amazon, you have different families. Which machine is going to be the cheapest one? Which one is going to be the fastest one? Which one is going to give you the cost efficient one? And again, if you can save $1 for 1 million RON, $1 million. So this is actually what Hummingbird does. And we published this in Bioinformatics. The tool is publicly available. And this was a collaboration with Amazon Web Services. And in this one, you can see that uh, it's a GATK haplotype color of one of the stages of the pipeline around BWA, you can see with being I3 family where, uh, and uh, C5A, they're like $7 difference here. And somebody is like just, you know, pick I3, run it for $1 million, $7 million wasted. So the, another application that uh, framework that we developed with VA MVP was around a Swarm, a federated cloud framework. The idea that somehow we are gonna have a centralized database right, to put everything in one database. That's never gonna work. The reason is that 
First of all, there, none of these cloud providers are going to dominate the cloud uh, industry. The other thing is that uh, making copy, moving private data sets across different cloud providers will cost you a lot, egress fee, right? The other problem is that every time that you're making a copy, you have to pay a lot, data redundancy. And the other issue is, of course, increasing the risk of security and privacy every time that you're making a copy, right? So what we did here is that we focused on the region of interest. This is a federated solution that can, you can run uh, stat queries. At first, it will run the stat queries on different cloud providers. It finds the region of interest, compress that, and finds the smaller, the smaller portion, and then move it to the other side and run the uh, query. It could work for uh, machine learning models also. You train it. One on, in one cloud provider, move it to the another cloud provider, and you can use this Swarm platform. Now, I'm going to get into uh, the last part of my presentation, which is around precision medicine and education. I believe in order to get to precision medicine, we need personalized education. We need the next generation of bioinformaticians that they can communicate really well together. So, and um, this is actually one of our nature papers being read 100,000 times. If you go to the bottom of any nature paper, you can see that there are two sections, data availability and code availability, right? And, uh, you know, let's say 10,000 people are actually trying to do, download the data set and install it. So it's a lot of work, right? Let's say five hours, 50,000 hours wasted here. So um, what if we have a platform that would help you with one click, you would be able to get access to the code and data at the same time? This is actually a Stanford Data Ocean that we are collaborating with Amazon Web Services. We recently developed that, and if you're interested to be a better user, please visit our website, deepdata.stanford.edu. We'll be happy to have you on our platform. We have created multiple modules around, uh, and we provided unique data sets on our platform, and a lot of uh, notebooks. So what we have done so far at Stanford Genetics Department, we created a computer, uh, a graduate internship program or computer scientists. You see 2018, we're recruiting more computer scientists. We also created a new course called Cloud Computing for Biology and Healthcare. Folks like Eric Schmidt actually gave a talk in this course and it's available in YouTube. And uh, you know, we have a lot of great researchers right now like Arash Alavi, he was my intern in 2018. He came and joined us, he had a background in security and then right now after couple of years, he's now the first first author of the Nature Medicine paper. And I have a, a MDU student here. I'm Thomas Beck. I'm a third year medical student at Stanford. And ever since I've been at Stanford, I've gotten really interested on how we could leverage all of the advancements that has been made in computer sciences to improve healthcare. Scalability is definitely an important thing to learn about because before you set out to build an infrastructure to process your data, you want to know that it's going to be able to help more than just a handful of patients in a feasible manner. And of course, uh, HIPAA compliance and security is important in developing any sort of cloud computing infrastructure. Because I think the average person is already a bit hesitant in using this technology because of security concerns. But what I took away from this course is that these infrastructures are actually much more secure than what we have already in the hospitals uh, if properly implemented. And this is our uh, website, uh, Deep Data at stanford.edu. If you're interested, we're always looking for collaborators. And I want to also thank uh, a lot of uh, my colleagues and uh, mentors for their uh, support, and also my amazing dad who passed away two days ago for all he has done for me. And with that being said, this was my presentation. Thank you so much.